Yeah. Good evening and welcome to the 2013 MedStar Sports Medicine webcast. We are live in the teleconference center at the Curtis National Hand Center at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. I'm Pete Gilbert from WBAL-TV and WBAL Radio. Thank you so much for taking part with us on Ustream. Now, if you're watching us on Ustream, it's accessible through Facebook and Twitter. If you would like to take your, we want to know what you have to say. We have lots of questions and great experts to answer them. Facebook.com, take part with us there. That's Facebook.com slash MedStarHealth. On Twitter, yes, you can join us there as well. Use the hashtag Sports Medicine Forum, and that is at MedStar Health for your questions. And of course, right in the chat space as well. We want to make sure we go ahead and get your questions because we've got an hour now from till about eight o'clock. We will be answering questions across the gamut of where we go with uh, all the different kinds of sports injuries. Now, one of the, of course, the things we want to talk about is the experts that we have with us, and we have. It's a pretty good panel, everybody. We're going to start right here on my left. Dr. Andrew Tucker, Director of Sports Medicine at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital and the head physician for the Baltimore Ravens, the world champion Baltimore Ravens. Dr. Tucker, one of the nation's most sought-after experts on concussions. We will have plenty with that. To his left, Dr. Frank Dawson, also with the Baltimore Ravens, the world champs, and the Medical Director of Sports Medicine at MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center. In the middle, sitting front and center, Dr. Richard Hinton, Director of MedStar Sports Medicine North, head physician for the U.S. Women's Lacrosse Team among the schools he covers, St. Paul's School and Towson University. Dr. Hinton is an associate team physician as well for the Baltimore Ravens. Dr. Milford Marchant to his left, the head physician for the Chesapeake Bayhawks, Maryland's Major League Lacrosse Team, an orthopedic surgeon at MedStar Harbor Hospital. And finally on the end, Dr. Derek Papp, a sports medicine fellowship trained physician at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital. Okay, so one of the big topics we want to talk about, of course, our concussions. They've become so popular as far as interest in them as we've recognized how dangerous they can be. And not too long ago, we did a PSA to talk about that last fall. Let's go ahead and show you what we learned last fall. Here's one sports injury that's easy to see. What's not so easy to detect is a concussion. And what used to be thought of as just a ding can potentially be dangerous. A concussion can have a long-term impact. That's why the Baltimore Ravens and MedStar Sports Medicine are working together to make sure you know the signs and symptoms of a concussion. For more information or for baseline testing, call 888-44-SPORT. When in doubt, sit it out. And thanks to Jamil McLean for helping us out with that PSA and Dr. Tucker, an expert with it. What, where are we right now in dealing with concussions that we, they become so prevalent? They seem to be more and more, they're more diagnosed now. Are, are we doing enough and where are we? Well, we know a lot more about them than we used to, and there's a lot more we need to learn. Um, I think the PSA kind of sums up one of the, uh, the, you know, the goals that we all have as sports medicine providers, which is when in doubt, sit it out. The meaning is we can't do enough education of young athletes and the coaches and the parents and everybody involved with uh, young athletes regarding the signs and the symptoms so that kids are appropriately pulled out of practices and games so they get properly evaluated and are not returned until their brain is ready to be returned to a contact or collision sport. Um, it's a culture change, Pete, there's no doubt about it. I mean, every other sports injury you had or I had or we all had, you tend to try to play through it. Concussion is a paradigm shift. When they have a symptom or a sign of concussion, the athlete uh, themselves or the people around the athlete, might be a teammate, might be a coach, it might be a parent, needs to be um, educated, educated, educated more and more about um, understanding what's going on and pulling them out appropriately so that they can be evaluated. How, how hard has that been? I mean, certainly from your level with the Ravens, I imagine it's, you know, you, you have an even more reign to just say, nope, you're not doing it. This is it. But, I, you know, I would imagine as you go through, you know, on the sidelines and, Again, the kids that grew up and the, the coaches that maybe aren't as well trained and grew up with it, as again, how hard are we seeing it to get people to understand that this is not something you can play around with? It's hard. Um, those of us in our generation grew up in an era when concussions uh, were known about but not taken very seriously. Got your bell rung. It was kind of funny, right? Got your bell rung. It was part of the game. It's like a rite of passage almost. Um, so. Uh, those people in that generation, i.e. us, are the ones that um, actually have to be educated along with the young people 
because it's, it's a paradigm shift for our generation to understand that it's not business as usual with mild head injuries. It really needs to, it really needs to change. Okay, and some of the questions are already coming in. I want to share one here with you. Uh, this is, uh, my son's school requires impact testing, but what do I do after he sustains a concussion? How do we get results and what kind of doctor should he see? That's a great, or she, me, great question. And some of we in the audience, we have some of our athletic trainers that work with us. Um, maybe that um, person writing that question uh, may have an athletic trainer at the school. They may not. If they do, they have an advantage because they have a very well-trained caregiver like the folks out here in our audience to help not only evaluate but to monitor the treatment and the appropriate return to play. If they're not fortunate enough to have an athletic trainer, well, they need eventually to be uh, sent to a physician. Now, not all physicians are the same with respect to interest and ability with respect to diagnosis and treatment and management of the injury. We have, fortunately, a cadre of, of sports-trained primary care physicians around the MedStar network um, who have a personal interest and an expertise in sports concussions. Not all pediatricians and family medicine docs um, are have the same amount of interest or experience in taking care of them. Some do, many, many don't. Mm -hmm. We're a resource, we're a resource not only for the patient, the parents, uh, but also for those primary care docs who may not feel comfortable with the injury. Dr. Dawson, you look like you had something to certainly to jump in here with us, and I have a question for you then afterwards. Sure. Then, sure. I think that question brings up a really interesting point when you talk about impact testing, and it's a word that you hear, and you hear neurocognitive <laughs> testing, and impact is a brand name of one of the neurocognitive tests that we use to treat concussions. And I think the important thing for parents and coaches and spectators and everyone in the community who's affected by concussions to know impact testing, neurocognitive testing is just piece of the puzzle. It is not the whole thing. It is not the end all be all. That is a piece of the algorithm that we use to decide whether it's appropriate for you to return to sports. And the other pieces are physical exam, history, history from your parents, from your friends, from your teachers. <clears throat> excuse me. So it's real. Excuse me, it's really important to understand that the impact test does not spit out a sheet that says yes you can play or no you can't play. It's a piece of information that's going to be considered by the caregiver, but it's not going to outweigh the other piece of information that help you make that decision. Yeah, one of the other things that Andy or Frank may talk to as well, particularly for the audience, is the fact that this is a bigger issue for the younger athlete, that it's a little bit different, it's a little bit more important, it's a little bit uh, different in how you handle them uh, as opposed to the adult athletes, maybe. Why is guys? that? Go ahead, guys. The younger brain <coughs> take longer to heal. Uh, they're probably more vulnerable to the recurrent uh, concussion. Uh, they're, uh, they take longer to heal. It's, uh, that's another sort of thing that you wouldn't expect. I mean, those of us that are older would expect we would be, uh, we would take longer to heal. Younger brains that are immature and still developing take longer to heal from concussions on average they take much longer to recover from and therefore take longer uh, before it's appropriate for them to return to a contact or collision sport. I would think too that helmets, uh, you know, we've seen so the technology is so great. I get, you get a new iPad every six months and it does a million new, different new things for you. The helmets, they, you keep talking about they're bigger, better, and, and they're stronger. And are, do we still maybe re want to rely too much upon them? And is that something we still need to be careful with in thinking that this incredible new piece of technology is going to take care of me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The technology is much better than it was, say, you know, 20, 30 years ago. But that being said, uh, you know, you don't see the same frequency of, of concussion in sports that don't rely on helmets. So, like, if you look at Australian rules football or soccer, there's lower rates of concussion because I think people tend to rely on the helmet and see the helmet as, some, as, a, as a shield in a way. And, right. And so... You, some cases a weapon. Yeah, or that. <laughs> the, uh, Dr. Marshall? Yeah, the, there's been a, a large <laughs> shift in, in youth lacrosse. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of how we're teaching the game and how the game is being officiated, uh, the sort of the takeout check, or particularly the helmet to helmet or the helmet to player contact, uh, you know, is starting to, you know, obviously we're looking at it from a medical perspective, but even within the rules of the game, you're starting to see a change in terms of, you know, teaching players to avoid that. And then obviously, if it does happen during the game, you know, uh, athletes are getting penalized for it. Got another question here from uh, online, looks like from Twitter. I have recently suffered a severe concussion three weeks ago and have been experiencing severe migraines since. Could the migraines be a result of the concussion even several weeks later? 
quick answer to that is yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, you know, headaches are the most common symptom associated with concussion, and they can linger and last for quite a long time. And actually, we feel like he head injury, even mild head injury, uh, can be a trigger for um, really unfortunate headache syndromes that can last for many weeks or months. Uh, another question here, uh, a healed neck injury, but still suffering headaches from the neck injury. Is that a nerve damage? Is that something again? How much, how, at what point do you wonder, do I need to go back and, and get this taken care of? Or is this just, well, this is part of the recovery process? Well, I think, you know, one of the things you have to realize is that head injuries and neck injuries are going to be intimately related in a lot of cases. <clears throat> and a concussion is actually an acceleration, deceleration injury. You don't actually have to be hit in the head. If your head snaps back and forth fast enough, you can suffer a concussion with your brain moving relatively inside your skull. That being said, there's also several conditions where the nerves exiting your neck and going up towards your head can be suffering from problems that can manifest in headaches when you're actually having pathology from your neck. So as uh, Dr. Tucker and Dr. Hinton were saying, you really want to make sure that you see somebody who sees concussions every day, day in and day out, and who understand the relationship between neck pathology and head pathology because the two can overlap and be separate, causing very similar symptoms. <laughs> Now, I know we're not coaches up here, but one of the, I talked with a coach recently who is discussing, a football coach, but I guess similar in lacrosse as far as just the contact, the way we approach things, where he thinks in five to 10 years, they're going to eliminate the three-point stance where you're down like that because the first thing you do when you come up is your helmet hitting another helmet. And if you can eliminate that, how much is that repetitive, not big jarring hits, just these kind of time and again, just that initial clash, how, you know, how, I think we're, we're, we're learning more about that can be, as bad as taking one really big hit. Is that, is that true? What do you, and do you yeah. think, is that, is that where you see these kinds of things head in that direction? We're starting to see, particularly in the, at the youth level, sort of the subclinical hit, or the hit that doesn't cause, you know, the, the, the severe headache, or the nausea, or the inability to focus. Sort of the just repetitive smaller hits, where they're starting to show up on, you know, functional MRI scans, where we're looking at the activity of the brain, the excitement in the brain. And I think that's, that's really scary because you know, we don't know when necessarily a hit that's injured the brain occurs. You know, it's in, the one, in the one sense, you don't want to get a concussion, obviously, ever. But the times that you do have symptoms, you can say, whoa, hold on, sit out, we got to rest this brain. The ones that don't quite meet that threshold but still may be doing damage, you know, that's, that's a big concern. I mean, back to your, your previous point, and it wraps, you know, it, it goes across to all of this, this concept of helmets being an end-all, be-all to answer. I mean, that's what the American public wants, is they want an easy, simple answer. we can answer. understand that. Put, put the kids in helmets and the injuries will go right. away. And we've had this very recent issue here in Maryland about uh, legislation was uh, put forward in the state house this year by making it mandatory for girls to wear helmets in uh, scholastic lacrosse in Maryland. And that would have probably defaulted to putting them into men's headgear. And all of the information that we have that really has been following lacrosse in quite a bit of detail would suggest that if you do that, then the overall injury rates in women's lacrosse would skyrocket. So it's an it's a issue of combining equipment with rules enforcement, with education, uh, with coaching and official certification to make sure that the game's integrity is there and that's coupled with the appropriate protective equipment. So it's never really quite as simple as just one piece of equipment. I know, and simple is what we all want right now, but I guess you guys aren't going to give it to us. <laughs> uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, to talk about concussions and some thoughts and concerns about anything we've talked, discussed thus far. Yes? One, of my one, so, one second, please. Let me get the mic over to you. One of my uh, <coughs> common questions that seem to occur a lot is because the impact testing has taken over but with parents that have kids that are not maybe at a high school with an athletic trainer is, I've had the impact testing done, they have a concussion. Now, is there an impact testing to follow up that allows them to play immediately after they take this test and pass it within a certain amount of time that they are able to recall information quickly? <clears throat> so many of them ask us that question. And again, I'd like to, you, the experts, give a good answer um, if people are, are watching or listening now what happens after you've had the impact test, then they've had some type of concussion or concussive force that it keeps them out and then allows them, okay, it's safe now to go back in. Is it, the, is it, is it some type of testing that they take again or you know, where, where, what allows them to come back into the game? Great question. So, uh, 
one of the best analogies I can give you for impact is an EKG. You know, if you walked into a into an ER with chest pain, you know, they would get an EKG to look at your heart and make sure that the rhythm was right. And if they noticed a difference or a change from what we consider normal, they might say you're having a heart attack. You might not have a change on that EKG. It may look totally normal, but your lab values, let's say, indicate that you're having a heart attack. So there are multiple tests that you look at. So even once the impact test is potentially returned to normal for that patient, you know, if they go out and, and run or compete in sports, those symptoms may come back. Just for example, if you were to have an intervention for that heart problem and your EKG returned to normal or close to normal, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be ready to go back out and, and run your marathon again or whatever sport that you would like to do. So I think that again, it's, as these guys have mentioned, it's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's simply that. And I think it, what it really indicates is maybe you're ready to go back and try to play or try to exercise, not necessarily return to competition. You know, I think it's a really good question and a question that I try with the schools and the athletes that I take care of to preempt. Um, I like to speak at a lot of fall and winter coaches meetings and speak to parents mm -hmm. and let them know how the return to play for a concussion is going to work before that situation arises because as you said there's so many times people show up in my office they may have seen another provider they may have not and they expect to be cleared the first day they meet me and that's an unrealistic expectation and I counsel people that if you find a provider who is willing to do that then you're not at the right place okay just as if you wanted to get your knee replaced you want to go to a surgeon who does knee replacements every day if you're going to be seen for a concussion especially as a child or a youth athlete you want to see somebody who does concussions every day and the algorithm for returning someone to play is like we said it's going to include impact testing it's going to include physical exam it's going to include <laughs> history from multiple sources but when all those things sound normal then we're going to start a stepwise progression to return to play. I'm not going to let you go back to soccer practice that day. I'm right. not going to let you go back to field hockey or figure skating or whatever it may be. And I use those examples because we've brought up frequently football and lacrosse in the last couple of minutes. And that sometimes paints the picture that concussion is a collision sport problem. And it's not. I see concussions from badminton, figure skating, <laughs> soccer, you name it, I've seen a concussion from it. So people have to be educated. This isn't a football or lacrosse problem. And when you are finally symptom free, we're gonna progress you back to play over about a week's time. And each day we're going to step up the level of activity. And there's gonna be two or three steps before you get to practice or possibly contact. I, you know, sure. I agree with Dr. Dawson. Completely. He, uh, I take care of one of the city schools and I had a, a athlete who just wasn't getting better and I eventually I sent him to Frank and and everybody's a little bit different like this guy probably had some vascular problem in his head before he was playing football and and this came out because he was playing football and he's probably done um, for now and 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 that's sad but you know you have to be careful and you can't rush somebody back just because their impact score is is normal and I would think too. What's interesting you mentioned about you know football. It's not a football and lacrosse problem. One of the things that, you know. I, but if you are a soccer coach, or if you where you're not, maybe concussions aren't you know one of the first things you're thinking about. So maybe you're not as quick to think that it might be there might mm -hmm. be a problem there. Is that something you really are having to deal with with coaches and getting explaining it's not not just for football and lacrosse, but for all of them. Certainly, I think you know especially on the high school level and on the youth level you really are dealing with athletes who are underdeveloped musculoskeletally. So a lot of times their heads are bigger than their necks and their heads flop around for all kinds of different reasons. So it's very important to educate the field hockey families that you got to watch for the backswing and the soccer families that you have to watch for the 1v1s and the slide tackling. It's not just a collision sport issue. And I think one of the other issues that we all run into with educating our patients is people think that football and lacrosse and hockey are contact sports. And in fact, those are collision sports. Basketball, soccer, those are contact sports. <laughs> right. You're not gonna play soccer and not get touched. So people have to understand that concussions are a risk for those sports. I think Frank's point about the little bodies and the big heads is a, is a great one. Um, I, could, I actually, I coach a youth lacrosse team uh, right outside of uh, Annapolis. And uh, I had three concussions in the first two weeks. Every single one of those concussions was an athlete simply got pushed over and his head hit the ground. You know, that again, big head, little body, huge helmet. The helmet too, that adds to it because you're so, adding weight to it. Yeah, too. so unable to control that, that movement of that helmet, you know, and the head hit the ground. Even with the helmet on, these kids were clearly symptomatic and, and they needed to seek treatment. Sounds like they need a better coach. <laughs>
Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. We're, we're getting a little rough. We're Shots little fired. Rough. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Hinton, you know, a concussion is something where is, you know, we're seeing more of them maybe because there's more year-round play and overuse injuries in general, not, you know, other than concussions as well. The overuse factor, you know, as a parent, what do you do? You know, what do you make right. sure to look for your kids? How do you deal with, because now it's, it is, it's, it's four seasons that, that kids are playing. Right. I mean, well, the concussions is a perfect lead in. I mean, concussions are more problematic for the younger athlete. And there's this old saying in pediatrics that uh, kids are not just little adults. Well, in our society today, our kids in large part are playing their sports in an adult model, in the same model that college kids and professional people are playing sports. And that leads to kids at younger and younger ages playing single sports year round which then leads to kids being in more game situations year-round rather than practice. Organized high-intensity play. And what we find is that not only does that lead to overuse and burnout amongst some of these kids, but it's leading to higher rates of major injuries like anterior cruciate ligament tears, ulnar collateral ligament tears of the Tommy John injury about the elbow. And they're injuries that uh, are significantly increasing and have a huge impact on the game. So what we try to counsel parents and kids is that, particularly for the younger kids, have your kids play multiple sports. Have your kids take a holiday, two-month holiday from the major sport they play and not play that during the year to give their body a break from that. Uh, make sure your kids are playing sports for the right reasons. And the right reasons for most kids to be playing sports is because they're having fun and they're learning life's lessons. Uh, and it's not for secondary financial gain or social gain. Um, now there's a huge cottage industry out there now that is driving the sense that if my kids are not playing at this summer league and getting in this club and getting on this travel league that they're not going to get a college education and be successful in life. And that's just not the case. I mean, we joke sometimes that by the time you pay for the private coach and the private lessons and the travel clubs, you've probably already paid for their tuition at most schools anyway. <laughs> so we need to back back a little bit and let kids play sports to enjoy their sporting experience now and not having to always worry about the next level of play. How common are the overuse injuries now that you see? Is that one of the more common things you guys see? Yeah. Right, fellas. Absolutely. I think it's, <coughs> you know, during my training, I had a uh, fortunate experience out on the West Coast dealing with a lot of baseball players in Southern California, and, I, and it was not uncommon to have a six or seven year old rising baseball player with a hitting coach, a pitching coach, like personal hitting right. and pitching coaches. And I think what we're starting to see now is that in the lacrosse world, we're starting to see, you know, which is obviously almost if not more popular than baseball around here, but it's, you know, you're starting to see that specialization infiltrate other sports. You know, little kids have strength coaches. I, I can't tell you how many 11 and 12 year olds have trainers that they work out with. I mean, it's, it's getting pretty significant. And one of the things I'm starting to see, obviously we see the classic injuries, things that you know, some of us grew up with, Osgood Schlatter's or uh, heel pain, the Seavers disease, but we're starting to see you know, non-contact, at least I'm starting to see in some of my lacrosse patients, non-contact spinal injuries, where you know, just that repetitive shooting continued throughout the year, uh, they're putting a ton of stress on their low back. And again, not taking that, that time off. And again, we've learned a lot of these lessons from baseball. And I think baseball has actually taken a couple steps forward in terms of- the Recognition. Yeah, in terms of having that rest period. Yeah. Um, well, and there's just this competing sense of good out there. I mean, the issue is, I mean, a great example, and Milford works a lot. We do, all of us do a lot of work with US Lacrosse, a very proactive, organizational health and safety. So we went through a three-year process, pulled in pediatricians, neuropsych people, orthopedic surgeons from all around the country and developed youth-specific rules for lacrosse that really decreased the amount of hitting, particularly for the unprotected player in the U13 game for boys. But we live in an environment where kids are signing oral letters of intent to go to collegiate programs between the summer of the ninth and 10th grade. So you've got people running leagues that say, mm, I don't know if we're, we're going to go with those rules because our kids need to be hitting because that's what we're right. preparing them for. 
So as parents, get to know your kids' coaches. Don't just drop them off at the game. Go out to the game, know their coaches, know what the goals are, and a major goal for your kids should be having fun, staying in shape, getting to know the other kids on his team. And if you get the sense that the only goal is to push the top 10% of those kids to the next level, maybe think about playing somewhere else as well. well and you mentioned baseball, and you talk about we've learned, you know, they've made progress and there have steps been taken. How much, though, should a kid pitch? How old? Can you throw a curveball? What are some of the things? I mean, do, are these specific? Or is that is that per kid, or is it? Are there general guidelines that everyone should follow on that? You know, the way things are set up now, it it varies per age, and it grows. There's a chart that you can follow very easy. I'm sure you can find it online, very easy, of how much you should throw. But a lot of kids will play. Again, you're playing three seasons or four seasons, or you're playing for multiple competitive teams, and that's another big problem. Because while you're in one league and you throw 70 pitches, you can be in League B and throw another 60 pitches during the course of the same week. So you're playing by the rules because you're not breaking the rules of the league, but you're, you're breaking the rules of what you should be doing for your own body. A lot of times what we'll see is, in fact, I saw a young, a young uh, baseball player today, high school, sophomore who been playing baseball all his life is pitching for his high school team you know as a sophomore he's, he's a good good little pitcher um, but in his off days he's playing catcher and if you look at the rates of Tommy John and owner collateral right behind pitchers is catcher and so if he's out there slinging 70 whether it be fastballs or sliders mm -hmm. or any of those other dangerous pitches that you know people talk about um, you know probably the worst thing you could do is put the kid behind the plate the next day and yet, and, and, and that, and again, it's that, it's that education, it's that, it's that, it's that taking that next step to really be proactive in terms of taking care of your kid. I think, you know, to piggyback on what you said with the multiple teams, multiple leagues, a lot of times parents don't look at overuse injuries as, as serious as acute injuries like rupturing your ACL or dislocating your shoulder. And the issue with overuse injury, it's that micro trauma, that small amount of damage that's done every day that you don't allow to heal. And a lot of that can be perpetuated by playing the same sport, playing the same position and not having any variety. A great local example I give to people all the time is the reason that Cal Ripken used to say all the time he was a great shortstop is because he grew up playing soccer. And I tell people he didn't spend all his time as a kid playing baseball and yet he is a Hall of Fame shortstop so you know you really the skills you pick up the foot speed you might pick up at a soccer or a tennis practice will help you on the football or baseball field and it keeps your body from moving the same way every single practice which can prevent some of those overuse injuries. The other issue is sometimes parents look at it when I run too much I get a sore Achilles or I get a sore knee and as Richard said Kids aren't little adults, okay? It's not just tendinitis that a kid might be having. They might be having a serious growth plate issue or growth plate pain. And you have to remember in the developing athlete in many locations of their body, as Milford alluded to, their bones are actually softer than their ligaments and tendons and they can have bony injuries where we think we may just have t tendinitis. That can actually be a growth plate injury in a kid. So it's very important to listen to your kids as they talk and tell you about your symptoms. It's very important to know that sports hurt, but if you're limping or you're favoring something, that might be a little bit more than just aches and pains. And a follow-up uh, question from, uh, from Facebook for us. So, so how do you prevent the repeat injuries? How, how do you keep this from becoming chronic uh, for these kinds of joint issues? Uh, I tell people a lot, uh, cross-training, very useful, okay? Even during your season, um, providing different activities to work those muscle groups are very useful. Also, paying attention to your body and listening and making sure that when the injury is small, you may take a day off. Missing a day is better than missing a week. Missing a week is better than missing a season. And approaching things with that common sense approach can keep you out of trouble in preventing a major injury. Uh, a question now from David C6, uh, quick Twitter question. What should I do to help treat rotator cuff pain? Something I will be interested in listening because tennis and I have not agreed <laughs> much anymore. Right, I mean, rotator cuff problems run to full gamut from tendonitis to massive tears. So, I mean, in general, conceptually, what you want to do is first take a non-operative route and get a full diagnosis of what you have. So see a qualified medical person that deals a lot with shoulder problems to get a sense of, of making the correct diagnosis. Uh, we have a lot of our physical therapists and athletic training friends in the office and I find that many of the problems 
uh, that rotator cuff patients have are often adequately addressed with a, a well uh, managed comprehensive therapy program that deals with core strengthening, that deals with scapula strengthening, and then rotator cuff. Any throwing athlete we have, the first thing we always talk about doing is strengthening their core and strengthening their, their upper back. So a lot of times with rotator cuff problems, the answer is non-operative. Um, certainly if you have diagnostic imaging that you have a full thickness tear or you failed long-term non-operative care, then Surgery has advanced quite a bit, and a lot of people up here uh, do a lot of them as far as arthroscopic rotator cuff repair, or minimally invasive repair. Usually uh, spend a lot of time about asking what other activities they're doing because a lot of people uh, might not put together that the uh, weight training that they're doing three or four times a week um, to get big and strong <laughs> that they think is protecting their shoulder actually is a type of activity that loads up the cuff and actually promotes or accelerates sort of some of these things. So again, taking a history and finding out everything that they're doing might provide you a clue as to why the problem is there in the first place and also how to manipulate things so that they, they get over it better, okay. quicker. It sounds like, again, to make sure it, the, for the parent, for the athlete, do the research to find out what, if you, if you want to have a stronger shoulder to throw or whatever, you need to figure out what it is and find out what's the really proper way to do it. It's not just having bigger muscles at the shoulder. I would love talking to people who are strength training and they can go up and put up 225, but if you take five minutes at the beginning of your workout and take a five pound weight and do a little bit of cuff exercises, that actually goes a long way in preventing the injury from ever coming back. And what's a, what's a drawback from Tommy John? This is a question from Richard Eleven. Tommy John surgery. It's a big surgery. Oh, <laughs> yes, it is, which has yeah. now become so commonplace in baseball. We hear yeah. from pitchers all well, the time. The it used to be a career, you, you you tore your elbow up and they were done pitching and then Tommy John originally had the first surgery yeah. and now it's you can come back in a year it seems and what are some of the drawbacks of it though I mean that's the problem is that it used to be a career ender and then surgery has advanced to the part that or to the point that it it can salvage your career or you can continue I mean you know again I trained down in the south so we saw a lot of three point three season athletes and a lot of UCL injuries a lot of Tommy John injuries you want to avoid the injury. I mean, because it does. It takes a year to get back. Even, even Strasburg last year. You know, he had his lim his innings limitations even, even after having the surgery done. Right. It's not a simple thing. So you want to avoid it if at all possible. Which drove Nationals fans nuts well. when I got to the playoffs. But that's for another story. Well, I mean, I think the other thing too is the perception is that everybody is Tommy John, and that if they get that point. ulnar collateral ligament surgery, that that they're going to have a, a wonderful you know 16-year Major League Baseball career. Um, there are a lot of, a lot of pitchers out there who, who don't return after ulnar collateral ligament surgery. And I think there's, a, there's this misperception that I'm going to get this, this scar, this sort of badge of honor, and I'm going I'm to come back and be a better pitcher. Well, if you come back a better pitcher, it's not because you had this done. It's because you took that year, which it does take, to return, and you worked on your core. You worked on the, the, the shoulder, the scapular stabilizers, all the muscles that you need to, do, need to have to be an effective pitcher. Hopefully during your return to throwing program, you worked with a mechanics coach and maybe changed that glitch. What was causing it. That caused that to happen. So, you know, yeah, you can come back a better pitcher, but wouldn't it be great to do all those things without having that surgery? Exactly. <laughs> right. Well, Tommy John, I mean, Tommy John was a power pitcher before his injury, right. and he was a finesse pitcher afterward. And what we see is parents coming in with 14-year-old pitchers saying, I want, the pro I want a Tommy John surgery. And I go, well, why in the world would you want a surgery on your child's elbow? It's fine. Oh, because it's going to make them a better pitcher. And that is That's just so not disturbing. reality because the vast majority of high school pitchers who end up with Tommy John procedures their career is not going upward, their career is going down. The MLB players, uh, maybe next to the NFL, have access to the best resources uh, in the, on right. the planet. And they're also some of the best conditioned athletes, but as Milford says, they've never taken 12 to 18 months off. And that really helps them when they return. So again, you don't want to think that you want your child throwing with elbow pain needing non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to compete, playing in too many leagues because I've always got the fallback, well, we'll just get the surgery done. That's not a viable option. 
Tommy John surgery a big part of it, but the most common, I think, the one we hear the most, and we have mentioned a few times, the anterior cruciate ligament, and it's become so prevalent in sports. And one of the questions earlier, is it now even more common in girls than it is in boys? Yeah, yeah Milton. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I think the, the current data, depending on which article you read, is somewhere between eight and ten times more common in the young female athlete uh, in comparison to the young male athlete. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of research going into why uh, both boys and girls tear their ACL. Um, and, and clearly, it's become a, it's become a big deal. Uh, and what we know from, you know, not just, uh, not just lacrosse data, but sort of data across the NCAA, ACL injury seems to be the biggest limit, or you know, the, the biggest injury that keeps young athletes out of sport. So while ankle sprains or, or what have you may be the most common, you know, kids tend to get back pretty quickly. The biggest time loss tends to come from ACL. So if we can do things to help educate athletes and coaches you know, through the use of our athletic trainers and physical therapists in, in ways to prevent ACL, I think we have, there is, there is pretty good data to support that that's possible. And, and we're working towards doing that. And here's a very a great specific question about this, uh, an online question. Last April, my daughter tore her ACL, her right ACL, playing lacrosse. She had surgery using her, her patella in June, followed by nine months of rehab and strength training. Three weeks ago, she tore her left ACL and had the same surgery last week. Can she play again? Yeah, I mean, an interesting issue is, is this, is eight, and again, the parents listening, uh, if your child, your scholastic age athlete, tears their ACL, they have a life-altering injury. It is a life-altering injury. Um, it is not as simple as get your surgery done and six months back you're playing at the same level. Uh, there are studies that are being done on large groups of high school age athletes that would suggest that the return to the same level of play after ACL injury, ACL reconstruction is on the order of 60%. That her, a young lady that is at high risk when she goes back to play, has as high as a one in five chance of having an ACL injury, either of the operative knee or the non-operative knee. So her story is unfortunately very common to all of us because the risk factors that got you there to begin with are the same ones that you take back out on the field unless you're working with the appropriate therapist and team to try to decrease your risk when you go back. So certainly I think everyone up here would be working with her to get her back to playing lacrosse, but addressing the underlying risk factors of how she jumps, cuts, twists, turns, and lands to try to decrease a risk of a repeat injury. Now it's a little bit different when you're talking about a revision surgery on the same knee, or a second time revision surgery, which we've all also seen. So, but it's, I mean, we could spend the next couple of weeks up here just talking about this single topic, but uh, I think a take home is it's a major injury with a major impact. And as Milford said, prevention is the key because it is so much better than treatment. Well, what are some of the most important things to do to prevent the initial uh, ACL tearing? Dr. Marchand? Yeah, there's, there's been a couple programs that have been developed around the country uh, and that have been evaluated and the, and the results are good. Uh, depending on the sport, you can see as much as a 60 to 90 percent reduction in ACLs. Again, these are, these are studies that were performed looking at specific sports, specific teams. Um, and, and some of the things that we like to do, in addition to strength training, which obviously seems like you know, something that you would want to do, is, is agility work. And, and plyometrics, and not just how high can you jump, but how well, how well can you land that jump? So actually, you know, neuromuscular education, so your ability to balance and, and perform certain agility work has, has been shown to be really helpful in terms of reducing the risk for ACL. I think one of the things that we have to remember, whether we're talking about ACLs or talking about concussions, is that all of these recovery times are going to be individualized for the athlete. Um, as I learned a great saying from my mentor, Dr. Tucker, professional <laughs> athletes are neuromuscular giants in every way. So just because Adrian Peterson got back in five, six months, 
doesn't mean that your child is going to make it back in nine months or a year. It really is individualized and like our, our surgeons are talking, the risk factors that you had, you probably still have and if you didn't address those, you have continuing problems. But I have frequently people come into the office and say things like, well, if I get Tommy John surgery, I'm going to gain five miles per hour. If I get an ACL, I'm going to be back in six months. And one, these are all questions best answered by your individual surgeon. But two, you can't necessarily take one situation and extrapolate it to your child or your athlete. You have to understand that the recovery time is going to be individualized. And if you put a time limit on that recovery, you're putting a lot of pressure that doesn't need to be on the athlete and possibly exposing them to more harm. I firmly agree with what Frank just said. I think that, that that pressure on the athlete sometimes to return is is huge. And that can be that psychological impact can be just as great as the as the physical trauma of the of the injury and the surgery. And I think Adrian Peterson is is a is a phenomenal example of of man how, how great this can go. I but mean, he's a to, freak he's a to, physical freak. Right, but so is <laughs> but so is Derek Rose. MVP of, the, MVP of the NBA, and it's been over nine months now, and he still can't confidently jump off of that, that leg. You know, he can do it in practice. He can, he, can, he can dunk the ball without any problem in practice right now, but he, but he can't right. get back to that competitive yeah, some level. Some of these articles you were talking about, too, they talk about that, the, the psychological, how things, how something changes in your mind when you have an injury of this, this nature, and, and you don't feel quite right, and so not everybody comes back from it. I mean, and Andy can speak to this data as well, but I mean, even in the NFL, there was a survey done at the combines that surveyed all of the orthopedic surgeons in the NFL uh, and asked them what they thought the return to play was after ACL reconstruction. And being sort of the self-centered orthopedic surgeon, so we can be sometimes, we said, well, 90% of people get back. Dr. James Andrews. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, but the number is 65%. Ever go back and play another dime? Now, there are a lot of things that play into that, fear of re-injury, being traded, someone else taking your position, but the same thing for our younger athletes. The, a great question is, is, is Derek and Milford give them a stable knee nine out of ten times, but they only return to play six or seven times out of ten. So it's not as simple as reconstructing the ligament. You have to reconstruct the athlete, and that has to do as Derek was saying, with a fear of re-injury, with a graduated return to sports, with risk acceptance, and a lot of other things that uh, has to do with attention with play and, and other issues, that it's just much more complicated than, than giving them a new ligament. And now, Dr. Dawson, uh, here's, a, here's a great question here. I'm a freshman in college and pursuing the field of becoming a doctor in sports medicine. I want to start volunteering. It's the best way to gain experience. Um, he just said it, volunteering. Um, <laughs> you know, getting into uh, any field of medicine isn't glamorous. You kind of got to get your hands dirty and spend your free time where a lot of kids are doing summer vacations and spring vacations having fun. And you need to find whether it's your neighborhood doctor or a doctor that you have a particular experience with or any other health care provider that's in your field and spend some time following that person. Find out if you really like it. You know, sometimes things look cool on TV. Uh, you know, standing on the sidelines on, for, you, stream. you know, <laughs> standing on the sidelines is great and people see all of us doing that and it looks like the greatest thing in the world, but they don't realize that we were in clinic in the office all day before we did that and we work on, so it's a great field, but it's not for everybody. So you want to gain experience, make sure that you actually like what you think you want to do. I think too, if, you know, depending on where, where the, uh, where the person goes to school, you know, sometimes there's a, a medical university, you know, intimately associated with that, that college or, or in that same town as that college or associated with the university. Uh, if not, again, there's, there's a lot of different avenues that you can take. Uh, other areas in medicine that not necessarily with a doctor, but uh, that still have contact with patients and deal with, you know, for example, injuries, you know, athletic training, mm -hmm. physical therapy, um, you know, working with, with those folks and volunteering with them you know, you know, it's great to learn how the body works right before you learn how it breaks down. So, you know, being out there and, and providing assistance there, you can get some insight into maybe what, what type of medicine you like to do. Because, for example, the athletic training side of things, they don't just deal with sports injuries. They're oftentimes dealing with medical issues, too. Right. And so, again, you may, you know, they, they see a whole another side of, of athletes, you know, unrelated to the biomechanics and the bones and joints. So. 
again, by working with them, I think you get great exposure you know, to the patient as a whole. One of the things, Dr. Dawson, you talk about the difference, and we've touched on it a little bit here, the differences with a pediatric skeleton and, a, and an adult one. And so going forward with that, how important, what are some of the things that parents, again, need to recognize and make sure that they understand uh, going forward to take care of their kids, make sure they get the most, we talk about having fun and, right. and learning life's lessons. Um, one of the things that I actually found myself saying several times today in the office is, everybody is conscious of warming up and stretching before you do your activity. After the activity is over, everybody grabs their bag, they want to go to Subway or Pizza Hut or do whatever and go do their homework and video games and it's time to go. No one stays and stretches afterwards. Most adolescents or childhood athletes, they can sit down for seven, eight, ten hours and then get up and play sports for hours at a time. They're never going to pull anything or tear anything. They're kids. But afterwards, they do need to take the proper time to cool down, to stretch those muscles out so they make sure that they start at baseline the next day. Again, when you start the next day with a little tiny micro injury that didn't repair from the day before, that's how things add up. The issue with kids is that their bones are still growing, so there are parts of their bones which are softer material than the rest of the bones, and those are very, very susceptible to injury and can easily be missed if you're only seeing a doctor who's used to looking at adult sports injury. So I tell people any sort of favoring one side or the other or limping, those are very, very reliable signs other than pain that your child may need to be evaluated. Yes? I would just put out one little plug, too, that if you ever see a swollen joint, that's never normal. <laughs> it's amazing how many times I, I see, you know, young athletes who, you know, oh, they've been dealing, you know, his knee would swell, and but then it would get better, you know, and, and you know, again, like kids who, kids get better, they do get better. But if you ever see a swollen joint, it, truly a swollen joint, you know, have that kid checked out. Right, and uh, you know, left to their own devices, kids are usually pretty good about modifying their activity. Uh, Again, I think everybody just needs to take a, a little bit of a step back and, again, uh, look at um, what kids are playing the sports for uh, and let them play for fun. And if it's not fun for a while or if they have an injury, let them take some time off. Talk to your kids and just listen to them and make sure that they're playing for their reasons and not for your reasons because what we see is kids who are rushing back from injuries that haven't been rehabilitated because of the, the, co the college recruitment schedule, or kids that are rushing back to play because their identity may be so wrapped up in their sports that if they lose their place on their team, then they're losing parental approval. So just lighten up on your kids a little bit, and I think that will help a lot with their injuries as well. Uh, you mentioned swollen joints. I've always put ice on a swollen joint. Is that is it heat or ice? What 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 should I do? Ice after. Ice after. Yeah. <laughs> Injuries. Yeah. Heat before. One. Heat before. Ice after. Ask our, our uh, experts out in the audience. They know better than we do. But in general, ice after activity. Um, and if you use heat, you use it before the activity to help get things warmed up. If it's a kid and swollen, that's bad. And I, I, then you need to be checked out more than the ice. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, when do they need to be seen? I, like Milford said, if you've got a swollen joint, that's a no-brainer. No, a no but a lot of times with overuse stuff, I mean, Richard or somebody said, sports hurt. I mean, that's, the, that's part of the game. So when do they really need to be seen, which is a question we get frequently from parents. And that's a tough one to answer. Um, but I... <laughs> I think in general, when the, when the discomfort or pain is interrupting their play, their practice, their homework, their sleep, their daily activities, that needs to be evaluated. If they've just got a little bit of soreness after practice, but they're fine the next day, well, that's probably something you can watch for a little okay. bit. But that's just sort of some practical information about when do they need to go in and when, you know. I mean, that's critical, too, though, as a kid. I mean, we exactly, what do I need to do with my kid? How much can I just watch yeah. and let it go before I go in and see? See one of you guys. Well, if any field athlete has a noticeable limp when they're playing, they should not be playing mm -hmm. because that puts them at risk for other injuries. And also tell parents, if your kid is not doing something they really love or enjoy, I mean, they may have a limp when they take out the garbage, but <laughs> if they're not going to their sport because of pain, yeah. then that needs to be looked into. So. Uh, if they're missing stuff that they really enjoy, if they have problems that aren't clearing up over a long weekend of rest, 
uh, if their performance is going downhill, if they're coming up with excuses about maybe why not to go to practice when in the past they've been very eager to go. So those are some of the cues that, that yeah, I One use. of the things that came up earlier about children playing in an adult sports model also has to come to this point. Sometimes the symptoms you start the day with may not be the symptoms that you end the day with. And I, I bring this up, especially with youth sports, soccer and lacrosse, they go to these play days where they'll have four or five games on one Sunday. And sure, when you started the first game, your knee was a little bit sore, but by the third game, you're limping. And I oftentimes hear parents say, well, it was the same knee injury, so why would I take him out of that game? And exactly like Richard said, well, if you're limping, you're not only possibly worsening that injury, but you're gonna hurt something else. So right. sports hurt, if it hurts, that's not that necessarily a big deal as long as you're moving with the proper biomechanics. But as soon as your body's not moving the way that you're used to moving, that's something that might need to be checked out. Last topic, then I want to start with Dr. Papp for us here too, the performance enhancing drugs. We, of course, it's a big deal in Major League Baseball and with football, you hear all these, these stories, but with kids, it's, I know how much worse it can be, you know, with a child using these things because their body is developing as it is. You add in a steroid mix to that and the, the the, the consequences can be so disastrous. So talk about what are some of the things that parents maybe not understanding what, how, just how bad this might be. Well, I mean, if you think about performance-enhancing drugs, it's, it's a lot of different things. It's not necessarily steroids. I mean, steroids is a big thing in the media nowadays. You know, whether you have these HGA clinics or HGH clinics down in Florida or whatever have you, but it's other things too, like stimulants. I mean, kids can take Adderall, they can take Ritalin, they can take different things to give them more focus and give them more energy and more aggression when they're playing. Um, and then you talk about the other things that are harder to get, whether it be EPO or blood, whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a, uh, it's a, certainly a, a problem. Um, and I'm not sure anybody really knows how much of a problem it is at, let's say, the high school level or, or less than that. I mean. If you look at NCAA football, you know, the, the estimates are anywhere between 1% and 3% of, of football players use some sort of uh, lean mass builder, or some kind of, you know, steroid. Or even a, a step below that, a, a Red Bull, the Monster Energy Drink. Well, that's a great, drink. I mean, that's and a that's, great question because that's going to kill you during, during training camp if you have some kind of thing that's, that's going on anyway. And that kind of stuff isn't necessarily policed. I mean, I, you'd see that in, in an NFL locker room before our game and get, you know the players are taking three or four red lines before the game begins just to just to get ready to go we see that at tournaments on weekends with the kids you know they show up you know, like dr dawson was mentioning about you know four and five games you know they're you know they wake up they roll to the field they're ready to go for that first game that second or third game man mom i need a red bull mm -hmm. and you know or you know or a monster or one of these other you know heavily caffeinated drinks, yeah. uh, full of sugar. And, and that, in addition to just the stimulant factor and sort of the, the toll that that can take on that, on that kid's body, what that also speaks to is sort of nutrition. You know, I think we still, today, it's easier to feed that kid some nuggets and fries, you know, right after the game. Oh, let's go to McDonald's, let's go ahead and sell, you know, celebrate, you know, let's go get a Happy Meal or go get some nuggets and fries. And I think that like if we're going to put the same demands on our kids, which again we've talked about maybe we shouldn't, but if, if, the, if those kids are competing in tournaments and things of that nature, uh, where you're playing several games or, or you're heavy in a season with multiple practices, their nutrition is just as important, not just for recovery, but for their development, you know, their, de their bodies are developing. And if they're breaking down muscle without providing that protein, that nice lean protein back, you know, you're going to be more susceptible to, to injury. I think, you know, it brings up a good point. In my practice, I do see a large proportion of youth and adolescent athletes. And one of my biggest problems with what happens in the popular media as far as performance enhancing drugs is, yes, kids aren't going to have necessarily access to steroids and epigen, but the stories they see makes them think the basic mindset that I need something extra to compete. And that is an issue and that's a problem and that's really a mindset shift that's happened in the last generation that I may not necessarily need steroids but if this kid next to me is not doing anything and I drink a Red Bull I'll be better I'll be a step up and so many times before youth football games I've seen you know kids pound a Red Bull right before they go out on the field and you have to realize that it's a give and take you might be gaining energy but you're loading your body down with caffeine and sugar and that's going to 
increase your rate of dehydration. It's the same issue with high school players, you know, with the creatine and the muscle builders. Well, you take all that stuff and you go out to a high school football practice, it's 95 degrees outside, you're going to get dehydrated much faster than other people. So you can't necessarily just take the things that your teammates are taking. Um, the other issue is if, like Milford was saying, if you eat a balanced diet, then all the things that you buy at the fancy nutrition stores, you're really just making expensive urine. You know, if you make a, <laughs> if you eat a balanced diet, you're getting everything you need as a growing athlete, and you don't need to go drop your allowance or your lawnmower money on all of the supplements at those different stores. Well, that was, you know, that was my next question. So they really don't need to take the, the enhancement, or are there any supplements or enhancements that you would say, yeah, that's maybe not a bad idea, or is it if just basically good nutrition takes care of all? For the average high school athlete, I tell them there is no supplement that they need to take that can't be made up with a well-balanced diet. Once you get into, you know, collegiate and professional ball, you know, the, the rules and the regulations and the parameters kind of change for performance enhancement. But in the high school and the youth level, you really shouldn't be taking anything as long as you're getting a good exercise regimen, a good diet, you're fueling your machine with things that are actually going to help you, not necessarily the fast food things, you're going to be okay. The only thing I would add is with female athletes, I, like, I don't mind them taking an uh, iron supplement. Iron I think su a, a, good, a good chunk of our female athletes are low in iron, whether they're anemic or not. Um, so an, a multivitamin What does iron. that mean then? What does that lead to? Anemia. If you don't have enough iron to, uh, to allow your body to make red blood cells, um, that can be an issue with regard to performance, especially with aerobic performance primarily. Fatigue. Fatigue. It's also yeah. a good time to take calcium, too, because yeah. that's your chance to calcium. load your body with calcium. I want, a day, I want a day for a female. I, I don't, you're not bashing on female, but a lot of, if they're, in general, girls are more likely to restrict certain, certain food groups, more likely to maybe uh, restrict things like red meat and so forth, which are good sources of iron. So you're just trying to cover that. Okay. I think the old adage too, I think we learn a lot about nutrition and sports nutrition in general. And I think that we see it in the Olympic athletes, we see it in their training tables, we see it now with a lot of the professional athletes that a lot of those, a lot of the guys that we're seeing out there have actually hired nutritionists to work with not only performance but recovery. And, and so it's, it's not just the number of calories, it's not that big huge carbo load you know, to, to sustain. A lot of times, you know what, you really need a balanced diet. You need a ton of protein as a growing athlete and as, a, as an adult athlete who's trying to play at a high level. And so, you know, a, you know, a well-balanced diet, you know, plus or minus a multivitamin, uh, you, know, with, you know, along with the other comments mentioned here, I think is a, is a good idea. I think it's important, too, that Milford, I mean, research has shown that if you, um, if you rehydrate soon after the, the four, four, four games, if, if you, you want to try to replenish your glycogen with, with carbohydrates right after the four lacrosse games you've played and actually uh, a source of protein probably actually helps you replenish your glycogen which is your you know your storage energy in your muscle so timing of nutrition is actually there's a there's a science to that as well I mean and the other big question I mean we, we talk about this sort of smaller slice of the young athlete that is trying to optimize performance with nutrition but we've also got the highest obesity rates now in the country amongst teenagers that we've ever had. And sport should play a role in letting those kids sort of establish lifelong sort of good uh, habits as far as staying in general aerobic condition and keeping themselves fit. So I think we can't lose focus of taking care of the high-end athlete, which we all enjoy doing, but we also need to bring some of those same tools to the general population to help with their overall health. And before we uh, wrap things up here to the audience here, and uh, we've got a couple minutes left. Of the, we've got our panel <coughs> of experts here. Any last questions out here? Yes, we have Eric Shelton from MedStar Health. Yeah, so my question is um, kind of related to the performance enhancers. What are the current recs in terms of youth uh, strength slash like weight training? I know the old adage used to be like, you know, wait until they're post-pubescent, but I don't know, what, what's your guys' take on it now? I think, uh, I think you've seen a, a big surge in uh, exercise regimens like CrossFit uh, where they use your own body weight and you can still get a killer workout. And I think that, that for, for young kids, if they're going to take that step and you know, start to work out or start to strengthen, I think that, um, again, done 
Done, a lot of exercise done with your own body weight can really enhance performance. I would say be careful. I, I think CrossFit's a great exercise as long as you've been trained on what you're doing because not, not every center has the same standards in terms of, of what you're doing. And, and so if you have your own knowledge of what to do in terms of uh, if you're going to do more than your own body weight because a lot of those places will have you doing crazy squats that aren't good for you. And I love to operate on this guy and, and those come in all the time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, you just gotta be careful when you do that stuff. I think one of the things that I tell people is strength is not worth losing range of motion. It's just not a trade that you wanna make as a growing and developed athlete. Um, so I oftentimes make the analogy, you know, you look at an elite pitcher, okay, who's probably more lanky and gangly, and you look at those guys on the world's strongest men competitions who can lift boulders, but they can't straighten their arms past here. Not being able to straighten your arms past here is not going to help you on the basketball court. It's not going to help you on the baseball field. So for the developing athlete, like Milford was saying and like Derek was saying, you really want to stress high repetitions. You don't want to stress a lot of high weight. You're not looking for beach muscles. You're looking for activities that are going to make you better at your sport. Okay. I'd like to bring up now Brad Chambers, the president here of MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, you once go, again, sir. I just want to thank everybody for coming out today and uh, joining us for this live webcast, especially our doctors, Dr. Andy Tucker, mm -hmm. Frank Dawson, mm -hmm. Rich Hinton, Milford Marchant, and Derek Papp. Thank you, gentlemen. No Excellent problem. job. Excellent mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'd like to thank our host, Pete. Thank you so yeah. much. My for pleasure. My pleasure. This was fun. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. I really uh, appreciate that. And all the people behind the scenes, putting together an event like this requires a lot of work. And a special thanks uh, to the Marketing and Media Relations Department here at MedStar Health, to uh, Deb Schindler and Michelle Klein and Joanna Shuba and Megan Lowy did a wonderful job here. And to our production crew, Marty, thumbs up. Good job to you <laughs> and your team here. Um, really, gentlemen, thank you. And I uh, want to welcome you all once again to come up, spend some time with our physicians here. And that will conclude our program. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, this, well, this program is going to be online as well. So if you missed part of it, just got in and car, caught a little bit of it. If we go to MedStar Sports Medicine, or check out, go to Facebook. We, the, we, got, a, we got a page there. It'll be online at facebook.com slash MedStarHealth. And once again, thank you so much, everyone. Great job, guys. This was, I mean, it felt like about 10 minutes. And we, did, <laughs> we covered a lot of ground, but a great stuff. So thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. And that's it.